Hello, everyone. Isaiah here, and we are about to start another Cheeky Scientist radio show. This is going to be a great show. It is on the science and humor behind a good PhD job search. Good to see you on. Hi, Zet. Kunlin Lee, Mark, Toby, thanks for being here. We're going to set up the live stream and off and away we will go. I'm going to start by talking about job referrals. There's been a lot of confusion on this, uh, as there always is, and I'm going to help break it down for everybody once the live stream is set up. If you're here in Zoom, you are special. You're an associate. You get access to the inside. We bring on New York Times bestselling authors, Olympic gold medalists, and much more here as part of our radio show to bring in some leadership qualities from the outside to you, PhDs. We also always interview somebody, a PhD in a job track, so you can learn more about that specific career and whether or not it might be right for you. So I'm gonna set us up here on Facebook. And that reminds me, I need to also stream to the Facebook group. So if you're here early, Thank you for being here. We're going to go live in the group as well. Lisa, you're probably there laughing to yourself because I totally forgot to set up my iPhone to stream live in the group. So for those of you on early, thanks for uh, saying hello, Christine Nanda. Appreciate you being here. You get to watch a little bit of the behind the scenes B-roll of us getting set up today. What we like to do is do two different views of the webinar. Now you get to join us again here in Zoom because you're a member. So for those of you who are new members, welcome. You'll get to stay on for the members only portion of the radio show, uh, which is very special because we do deep dives into LinkedIn resumes, uh, resumes as well, uh, LinkedIn resumes, resumes, LinkedIn, interview questions, and, and much, much more. So we start the show here by getting set up both on Zoom with our audio and camera. So if you can hear and see me okay at this point, please say yes and hello in the chat box. We have Lisa in the chat box. We'll also have Mary there as well. Mary will be coming on with us. And we got a great show lined up for you. I'm just gonna set up the live stream in the private group. In case some of you have to go, you can watch the radio show there. Maybe take a peek as you're walking down the halls or working in the lab. And this radio show again is the science and humor of a PhD job search. We got a great guest lined up. We'll start the radio show officially here very shortly. As soon as we get the, the next link here live, we will be off and running. Any new members with, with us? Say me in the chat box if you would. Good strategy for you, Mario. I like that. All right. I'm just adjusting my, my uh, second camera over here if you're wondering what is he doing we're about to go live here we're just getting set up and away we go okay so now we just got to set up one more live stream so lisa if you can let me know if we're live in the facebook group that would be amazing thank you very much we're just going to set up and go live here on the public page but again because you're here as an associate because you are an associate, you get to stay for the members only portion of this show. And we're gonna be covering a lot, resumes, LinkedIn profiles, extra insights for you for members only. So it's great to see more of you signing on here. Beth, good to see you on. Asha, good to see you on. Verena, good to see you on as well. Vasuda, good to see you on. Toby, we'll be getting started here in just a couple of minutes. We have a great show lined up, lots to cover. It's gonna be a very informative show. We have a Great, great guests lined up. We're gonna have on Jeff Kreisler, who is an editor in chief at People Science. He's an author, speaker, behavioral science advocate. Very funny guy, so excited to have him on. And we're just gonna work here to get the live stream set up on 
the public page and then we'll be off and away. Sometimes Zoom gives us a, a little bit of trouble here. We'll troubleshoot and see if we can make this work. All right, anybody else that's new? Any new members here? Sejolo is new. Hello, Sejolo, good to see you on. Let's see who else we have. We have Addis on, good to see you on. New members, welcome. All right, so Lisa, we're not, the stream's not working live. I'm gonna try, let me try one more workaround and then we'll be good to go here. But I think we're, we're live in the group. Good to see everybody on here. Remember, you can join us on Zoom as well in the chat box, but I see Valentina on, Andy's on as well. Many of you are on, you can join us in Zoom or you can watch where you are. All right, so let me just get the other live stream going. Today is the, wow, October 2nd, huh? The science and humor of a PhD job search. That is today's show. Looks like good old Safari might work for the live stream on the public page. So Lisa, let me know once you see that and we will be on our way. Okay, I think we are live. Hello and welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. I am your host, Isaiah Hankel. We have a great show lined up for you today. Today we're talking about the science and humor of a PhD job search. The science and humor of a PhD job search. We have a great show lined up for you. We have a very special guest on today, Jeff Kreisler. He's the editor-in-chief of People Science. He's an author, a speaker, behavioral science advocate. He's been on TV, very funny guy. Excited to bring on Jeff. He's going to talk to us about how humor can help you not just get hired, but thrive in your role. He's going to talk to us about topics beyond humor, the behavioral psychology, really the science of how people interact and how it will help you, especially once you get to that stage of interacting with another person in your job search, networking, job referrals, informational interviews. You probably realize by now that you have to show up and engage with people to get a job. They do not just hand out high-level PhD jobs to people that cannot function normally in society. This means not being too aggressive, not being too awkward, um, not being too insecure, but at the same time being authentic, being able to talk about problems, weaknesses, shortcomings. After all, one of the most popular interview questions is, what's your biggest weakness? Do you know how to answer that deftly as well as maybe slightly humorously in the right way? What does that mean? We're going to talk about it today. We're also going to bring on Addis Fuhrer. Very excited to have him on. He's a senior modeling and simulation engineer slash analyst. So we like to bring on a PhD working in a different career track every radio show. So you start to learn about the options that you have available to you as a PhD for either your first job in industry or your next job. We're going to start with the show me the data section. Then we're going to move into our special interview with Jeff. He's our external guest. We always bring on a leadership guest and then our internal interview uh, where we focus on a specific career. So a few, uh, a few items first. I want to talk to you about job referrals. For PhDs, there's a lot of confusion here. What is a job referral? Why is it important? How do I get it? I'm going to try to tie a bow around this for you in terms of understanding in just a few minutes. So a job referral is very simple. and It's where somebody else that's working at a company says that you should work at that company too. Who do they tell this to? They tell it to the hiring manager or a decision maker at that company, okay? Specifically, it's called an employee referral. Why do we care so much about this? Because the best chance you have of getting hired at any company is if an employee at that company says, you should hire this person, this person being you, okay? Makes sense? So if you wanna work at Pfizer, if you can get a Pfizer employee to say, yeah, you are a good job candidate, or yeah, you're even just normal or nice because you met during an informational interview. You, your name will go to the top of the list. It's how it works. The data shows it time and time again for PhD level jobs. 60 to 70% of them are filled now through these types of employee referrals. A question that comes up a lot is why would an employee want to refer me? What's in it for them? Often they get bonuses and the averages, if you look at the data, is between $500 and $5,000. Now that's, those are large swings. The actual mean is I think 
about two thousand dollars. So it's a substantial uh, chunk of change. Okay, it's a, it's a lot. It's like an entire. It's like half a month salary for getting you hired. Companies invest a lot of time and money in talent acquisition, one way or another. The the lowest hanging fruit for them, the easiest way for them to find out about new job candidates and to find job candidates that would actually fit in with the company is to, of course, ask an employee at their company who's currently fit in who they would recommend to work there. Because if an employee says, oh, you should definitely hire so-and-so or I know so-and-so or yes, I could work side by side with so-and-so, that goes a long way because that employee is at the company. It's not like some external person saying, oh yeah, you should hire them when that external person doesn't have a consequence, right? If the person does not work well with others. The employee is going to be working with the person they're recommending. That's why employee referrals are so powerful. Does this make sense? So what does this mean for you? How do you actually get employee referrals? You don't go out and spam people and bombard them and send them your resume and ask them for referrals. You just don't do that because employees, their job is not number one to get referrals. They get a bonus if they refer somebody, but it's not their job. They're concerned about their salary first, their work first. What does this mean? It means you have to approach it very differently than if they were a decision maker, okay? It's very, very important for you to understand that. So how do you approach an employee to get a referral, especially if you don't know them? Ideally, you'll get an introduction to them. Instead of just cold contacting them, you'll get introduced to them through a shared connection. This is why building up as many connections as possible on LinkedIn is so important. If you get an introduction, you talk to them, However, however the link happens, you want to move from being introduced and saying hi to adding value in some way. Adding value is pretty simple. You can mention, you know, that the holidays are coming up and you hope they have a good holiday. Seriously, it's that simple. Adding value just comes down to not asking for anything, okay? Unless it's for advice or their opinion, which is really adding value because people love to give their opinions and advice. You elevate them as an expert. Adding value can be as simple as reading their LinkedIn profile and commenting on their interests or an influencer they, they follow. Finding a book maybe that one of the influencers they follow wrote or an article and sharing it with them. Maybe complimenting their work. They publish something on LinkedIn. Guess what? If somebody publishes something on LinkedIn, if it's there, they know it's public. They're hoping that somebody appreciates it, showing them appreciate, appreciation for it. Right? So starting to build the professional relationship in that way before you ask for something. And this is what turns most PhDs off. Oh, who has time to actually add value or if I add value, they're going to know what I'm doing. They're going to think I'm manipulating them. Now, what's manipulative is when you reach out to somebody and ask them for something right away selfishly. Finding out about a person, investing in a professional relationship is not manipulative at all. Okay, so it's very important for you to understand that when you add value, right, it really stands out. It differentiates you. People that are working in industry they get bombarded by other people asking for help with their resumes or a job all the time. But if you reach out and you don't actually ask for anything, it's intriguing in a good way. All right. You compliment them. They're going to know, yeah, that maybe you're leading to something else, but at least you had the courtesy not to ask for something when you first met them. And then where do you go from there? So you add value. You actually start to build a professional relationship. And then maybe after adding value two, three times, all you're doing is working towards an informational interview which does not have to be a sit down interview with the person. It's just where you're asking somebody who works at a company, a couple of questions about how they got into that job and what they enjoy about it. That's it. And I'll, I'm going to give you a metaphor that I like to use on how powerful this can be and how it's very different than asking somebody for a job. If you go up to somebody that you kind of know in a lab down the hall, somebody that maybe you, TA'd with once, or you met at a conference, and you ask them to help you move your apartment, they're going to look at you like you're crazy, and they're going to come up with 10 excuses about why they can't, and they have to do something over the weekend, and they're not available, right? Of course. But if you go up to that same person who you don't know really well, and you ask that, or you tell them, hey, I'm moving my apartment. Have you moved in the past? If so, do you have any advice for me? How likely are, are they to give you advice? Very likely. People love giving their advice. People love giving their advice and opinions so much that usually they have to force unsolicited opinions on people. When you actually ask them for their advice or opinion, you elevate them as an expert. People love it. Okay. There's a lot of behavioral psychology behind this. Maybe we'll be able to talk to Jeff about it, but that's the difference. So 
Elevating somebody as an expert during an informational interview is what most likely leads to a job referral. Okay, so I'm going to connect the last dot for you here. You're talking to somebody on LinkedIn who works at a company, maybe by email, you got an introduction, whatever it is, you want to get to the point where you can ask them two to three questions, a time dependent and topic dependent request, which is the informational interview uh, setup. Hey, I'm going to be making calls tomorrow. I'm going to be sending messages tomorrow. Is it okay if I send you a quick message and just ask you two to three questions about how you got into your job and what you enjoy about it? That's it. Most people are going to say, yes, of course, because the barrier to entry there is very low. The pressure that you've put on them is very low. The activation energy, so to speak, is low. It's very easy to say two to three questions, no problem, right? You're going to be making calls anyway or sending messages already anyway. Sure, no problem, right? But if you say, I'm just going to call you tomorrow, do you have time to talk about your job? It's too open-ended. They don't know what they're committing to, right? You see the difference? You set up the informational interview. You ask them a couple of questions. They're going to tell you what they do, right? They're going to feel special and valued and appreciated. They're actually talking about their job, right? Which makes them feel important. And a lot of other factors, again, that maybe we'll talk about when we get to our special guest who is a behavioral psychology expert. Long story short, the law of reciprocation is going to kick in. They'll talk about themselves and what they do a lot. And people can't help but say, you know, enough about me at some point. What about you? And that's where you get to talk about the fact that you're looking for a job. And then you can mention, are there any uh, jobs becoming available at your company? And remember, there's something in it for them because if they refer you and you get hired, they get paid. So this is a great way to get inside information. And then to simply ask, can you pass along my resume to the hiring manager for this position? Or can I use your name on a cover letter as a reference? Okay, so hopefully that demystifies it a bit for you. We have a lot to cover today. We're going to jump right in to the show me the data section, which I'm going to share on my screen here. Just give me one second. Oh, I'm, getting, I'm being reminded that I also need to mention one other thing. Oops, that's not working. Let me try that again. I do want to mention a new blog article that came out a couple of blogs. So if you go to cheekyscientist.com blog, you can see all of our trending blogs here. Number one is why you should pursue a career as a data scientist. A lot of people have been asking us to do these deep dives into specific career tracks. So we're going through them one by one, the top 40 careers for PhDs. Data scientist is trending. We just released one on application scientist. It's a fun article to read. If you like to travel a lot, you like to speak and teach, might be the right position for you. Another great article that came out recently is three big worries that hold PhDs back from success. You definitely have to check out number two and three on this list. Um, great article there. Um, CheekyScientist.com blog is where you can see all of our blogs. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do the show me the data section and I'm going to bring on Mary Truscott to walk through this section with me. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great, Isaiah. How are you? Very good. Please, everybody say hello to Mary. Hi, everyone. Mary is a fellow PhD, and she loves data like we all do. And uh, she's much more meticulous than me, so it's great to have her on so that we can go through this and ask good questions about data that's relevant to what we're going to be talking about today with our guests. So if you can see my slides, for those of you that are associates and here with us in the chat box, please type in yes, or you can just say hello to Mary. That'll let me know you can see it as well. The first figure that we're looking at here, the title is, is humor, an, uh, is humor an asset in the workplace? Humor creates a happier workplace and it's a quality that top companies are looking for in new hires and fostering, uh, they're looking to foster it in their corporate culture. This is becoming more and more important, right? Why would we be talking about humor and you know, just, I guess, charisma, the way you act, people skills in general. Why do we touch on this so much? It's because it's more and more important. We see a lot of PhDs do so much hard work to finally get to a phone screen or a video interview or a site visit, and then they show up like a robot and they read answers out of their head because they've never practiced anything behaviorally and they fail. And then they hit it, they get rejected and they get into slumps. They feel depressed for three to four weeks and then they have to get back on their job search and it wastes so much time. That's why we're talking about this. So um, this is at wlol.iza.org. Um, it's an article on why happy workers are more productive. So we're looking at a figure here where the, the figure title is companies rated best places to work um, 
outperform the S&P 500 index, which is a stock index of 500 companies. I don't know if it's exactly 500 anymore, but companies that are rated best places to work as far as the employees rating them a great place to work where employee happiness is up, they outperform uh, this index, which would be like a, a control. So why, why is this surprising and not surprising, Mary? I don't know. I mean, you, I guess I've looked at the data a little bit, so <laughs> I might uh, spoil a surprise here, here. But, um, you know, they, they show that if you look at the top performing companies, um, the people there are happy, but they also have shown that people who are happy perform better and that impacts the performance of the company, right? So it, it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think as PhDs, it's very easy to become performance focused first and to sometimes not look what comes upstream of performance. Like what's actually allowing you to perform better? And if you, you know, I'm using the word upstream, downstream, of course, if you're in, I guess, a life scientist or whatever, that, that just means what comes before performance? Yes, you have to perform. Yes, in your mind right now, that might be all that matters, the data of performance, but things actually allow that to happen because we are biological creatures. So if you don't get sleep or eat or whatever, it affects your performance. But there's other sides of this behaviorally that affect performance. If you can't get along with your team members, if you, if you're, you know your PI, PI is angry at you and that's renting space in your head, how does it affect your performance? That's all that this is showing. And it, it's showing that it comes, it actually affects not just performance, but profits, dollars and cents too. Okay, let's move forward. So humor is often downplayed because it's subjective on both ends. This is important, right? So it's subjective on your end. Like I might think I'm very funny, um, but it's also subjective like on Mary's end. Mary might think I'm not funny at all. So there's two subjective uh, perceptions that are, that, are, that are affecting humor. So it's hard to... Uh, pin down how to be funny. There's so many studies out there that show that if you come across as humorous in the right way during an interview, a phone screen, at work in general, you're more likely to get hired, get promoted, on and on. But how do you find that balance? And so we wanted to talk a little bit here about how uh, humor, I guess, affects not just productivity in the workplace, but how our perception of humor uh, determines whether or not we'll actually take the time to, to be funny, to be self-deprecating, to say a joke in front of a boss who we're worried may not think we're serious about our job. So the Dunning-Kruger effect, Mary, what is this and why is it important to mention here? Um, so this is related to its cognitive bias and they're talking about confidence here. So mm -hmm. confidence versus competence. So if you look at the far left of the graph, people who are maybe of lower competence, um, some of them are very confident in their abilities. And then you go through the middle where people, I don't know, is that like a modesty or an imposter syndrome? I'm not sure. Um, but they have, they're quite competent and they're not necessarily as com confident about that. But then when you get to the upper end of the range, people who are extremely competent, who are experts, um, also have that confidence. So it, yeah, it shifts depending on where you are in the spectrum. Yeah, this could also be called like the PhD student effect, right? You first start and you're like, oh, I can do this. I'm one of the smartest coming out of my undergrad, right? I graduated at the top. I'm, my career is going to be amazing. I'm going to be a doctor. And then you're like, wow, I don't know anything at all. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And then you're surrounded by other people that were at the top of their classes. And then you just hit this slump in grad school. You're, you know, two or three or four. And then finally, you start coming out of it. Maybe it's not till well after grad school. Maybe it's a postdoc. Some time you come out and you start mingling with regular people, right? Maybe it's after your first industry job and you're like, wow, I actually know a lot. I can learn very quickly. I'm amazing at research. I can actually analyze data where most people fall asleep doing it. And then you get your confidence back. And that's a big part of, you know, what we're encouraging a lot of you to do. Yeah, I think I went through that as a postdoc. I changed fields completely. And then I came in and I was supposed to learn new things, but I was the postdoc in the lab. Um, but then, yeah, you build up the confidence again. I think that's also a pattern that people might see when they get their first industry position, right? Yeah. You get there and you're, you're learning the ropes. You don't know, you're not the expert yet. Um, and, and then the more you go, the, the more confident you are. Yeah, and I would say, you know, for this, and, and we're going to tie this together with humor in a second, just if you can try to find a, a linear line here to sit on instead and just realize that sometimes you're going to feel 
you know, you might be overconfident. So you want to counterbalance that with being a little bit more careful. Other times you might be underconfident and you want to counterbalance that by being a little bit more bold. Don't just operate based on how you feel, but try to counterbalance it with logic. The same thing goes with humor. So there's a, very, there's a study here that connects the dots in terms of some people think, okay, just like you think you know everything, you may not actually know everything. Some people think that they're really funny, but they're not funny at all. I think we all know some of those people. Um, it might be myself. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> because, right, it's so subjective. And then there's other people who are really funny, but they don't think that they're funny. And so it's just amazing to see that Dunning-Kruger effect even influence something like hum humor. All right, so can you walk us through this figure, Mary? Sure, fuzzy. yeah, so yeah, we're looking at different quartiles, I guess, of, of, um, of funniness. And there are two lines in the graph, and one is the perceived uh, ability to be humorous, and then the actual test score. And you see a big difference for the people who are of lower um, humoristic abilities, I guess. Uh, and then, you know, it crosses as you get to the top, but the really funny people um, don't realize that they're as funny as they are. Or... Yeah, exactly. So, you, I mean, people, we've all met somebody who tells joke after joke and they're just not funny and it's almost funny that they're not funny, right? But they think they're super funny. Um, and, and so that's what the first quartile is showing. But then there's also people who are like experts or comedians and which are like, you know, it's just another type of art and they are actually really funny they've have it down to a skill, but they don't feel like they're funny because they're super harsh and critical over their jokes and their funniness. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah. And I, I, I might be um, talking about something we're about to show, but I think um, somewhere I, I saw that if you even make someone smile, that is a positive impact. So you yeah. don't, you know, if you don't think you're the funniest person and you're concerned about where you are, where you might be on this scale, um, you know, just to try, and match a person's response. I mean, if this is in an interview situation and the person interviewing you is being funny and the things are light, then you know, that's a good time to add in, add in some jokes or a little humor, make them smile. So you know, don't take this too seriously, I think. Yeah, and I, I would say, so it's not, don't see it in a bad light. The point is, is that everything, even humor, follows this Dunning-Kruger effect a bit, right? So, and the only way to get better is through practice, no matter what the skill is. So just practice, practice being happy. That's the start of humor. Can you be happy? Say hello to people when you meet them, smile. Um, you know, can you be a little bit self-deprecating? Can you be a little bit positive when something happens bad instead of just focusing on the negative? And as PhDs, I talk about this all the time. We're really taught to be critical of data or critical of our research. And that mindset carries over into how we see ourselves and other people. So we become some of the most critical people in the world on others. And what a lot of people don't know is that we're even more critical on ourselves. So I want you to not take people and the little things that come up day to day so seriously. You can still be very serious about your work, your data, your performance, et cetera, but you can, you can be light uh, as well in terms of your attitude. So let's, let's go on. Before we bring on our first guest, I want to go over a few other uh, data uh, or studies that have been done. The rest of them are shown in little infographics here. So there's a, the Robert Half International Study that 91% of executives consider a good sense of humor important for career advancement. I've seen this over and over and over again in lots of different studies. Humor goes a long way to really diffusing negative situations, yeah. um, to improving people's uh, motivation and it's a, it's a great workplace habit. We're gonna dig into what types of humor there are here in a second. Um, the study also found that 84% of people feel that humor or the executives feel that people that are funny do a better job. However, it's underexpressed at work, okay? Humor is so important. So the, the figure here is just showing a, a little, uh, three more pieces of data from the study. 22%, only 20% found that uh, employees sense of humor Oh, here's the question. How important is an employee's sense of humor in him or her fitting into the company's culture? And then Mary, maybe you can tell us the results of that study and the, the three pieces of data I referred to. Yeah, sure. So there are, I'm adding up here, 78% <laughs> 
said that it is important. You know, 22% said very, 56% uh, said somewhat important, but what's important <laughs> is that uh, sense of humor does play into how well you fit into the company culture. And yeah. only 22% said not at all. And I, I yeah, I think um, there was a really good metaphor by, I, I believe it was Peter Drucker, who is somebody who wrote a lot of different books on business management, who said humor is kind of like oil in an organization. So it's, you know, the, the gears, right? The performance, the things you have to get done really matter, but the oil allows them to operate a little bit more smoothly. So you can't be just, you can't be all oil, right? Too much oil and it's going to be all sloppy and the gears are going to get out. You have to have just the right amount. And so being nice, showing a sense of humor, et cetera, but still getting stuff done, that's really the balance you're looking for. And can I just add too? So we always talk to our members about having informational interviews, right? Get to know the company, get to learn about the position yes. um, before you get the referral, before you have your, your interview. And this is something that you can kind of ask about or assess, like, what is the workplace culture like? Because you want to know if you're going to fit in there. And it also can help you um, get a sense of maybe how the interview might go or how much sort of being light or humorous um, is sort of safe or, or how much to, to focus on that during an interview. And, and, you know, and whether or not you'll be, you'll be happy there because some people, yeah, if you really value humor and happiness, then that's something that you're assessing in the informational interview yes. and in the interview itself. Yeah. Exactly right. I mean, humor is a great gauge for what the culture is like. And so make sure it's your level of humor too, and that you can contribute to whatever level is at the organization already. So why is humor missing at work? Another study with so many benefits of humor, why do only 33% of workers use it? Like 70, what is this? No, 60 7% of workers aren't using humor. And it's true, like a lot of people, they get to work and they're just like acting like they hate being there, right? Or that it's super serious. Having a little bit of humor, no matter what culture you're in, this is true. I worked for a couple of years in Germany, right? I've uh, worked in the UK. Now, there, I don't care what culture it is, there's gonna be slight differences. The humor may be different, but humor is a worldwide phenomenon. It's been proven over and over in studies laughter, humor, it's global, okay? The type of humor is gonna be different, right? So there's gonna be cultural differences, but no matter where you're working, where you are, this can help you. Uh, so can you take us through the rest of the, the data here, Mary? Um, so yeah, the question is why, why do only 33% of workers use humor? Well, 7% of workers don't see its value. Um, so hopefully if you were in this 7% before, um, we can lift you out of that. 15% uh, think they don't have the time, which I think is kind of funny in and of itself, right? Yeah. You can actually get more work done if you inject a little bit of humor. 36% um, say they don't know how to be humorous. Mm. Um, and 41% think they're actually that the bosses or peers wouldn't approve. Yeah. And it's pretty fascinating. So now, the last question we want to cover before we bring on our, our special guest to talk more about this is what type of humor? I think we're going to go right to types of humor, how to recognize humor. So of course there could be unlimited categories of humor, but in general, there's really four that you'll see often. Only three of them are really appropriate for the workplace. Um, so the four styles of humor that we're looking at here are affiliative, self-enhancing, self-defeating or self-deprecating like I referred to earlier, and then aggressive. Uh, so these four types of humor, uh, Mary, do you wanna walk us through a little bit, uh, a little description of, of each type of humor. Sure, so I mean, just from the title alone, aggressive, um, and, and I don't know if you can see, uh, the people yeah. who can see the slides, it says not really appropriate for work. So if the title didn't, didn't uh, give it away, uh, that's not appropriate for work. So disparaging others as a way of manipulating them, making fun of them, um, don't target your humor against other people. Whereas self-defeating or self-deprecating um, humor when, when this is about yourself, um, that, that can be um, more appropriate at work. Uh, Self-enhancing is when you find amusement in life's hardships and you stay positive. Um, I think that's a great way of getting out of maybe what could be a tricky conversation or a tricky situation to, to sort of put it in context and, and see the positive. And then affiliative is amusing others as a way to facilitate relationships. Yeah, so it's humor. So let's, I'll just do a practical example, right? So affiliative might be where you're talking to two different people in the workplace 
and then you make a joke about how you know the three of you will have to work on this problem so much you're like three corners of a triangle and you give yourself a nickname the three corners of the triangle and like a simple joke right none of these are going to be advanced but like something like that right where you're bringing people together you're saying a, a silly joke whatever and a lot of this comes down to being okay with feeling stupid as the one that's creating humor right how many of you have seen the show the office like you're gonna be maybe you're maybe gonna come across like the the michael smith of the office or like any of the characters on the office when you're doing this like when you say a joke but it has a positive effect on people because you're creating just a little bit of humor, right? You might be, a lot of it's going to be self-deprecating. It's going to be silly or stupid. A little bit of it though goes a long way. You know, self, self-enhancing, like Mary said, it's more just positive, right? Using something as an example of how you can get through it, right? It can, you see people do this all the time. It can come off very charismatic if it's done correctly. And I think if it's balanced with self-defeating, which like, oh, are you kidding me? Like, I, I, I can do this in my sleep, right? Something like that. Like, just said in the right way is kind of like a sarcastic joke on yourself, but in a positive way, like you're amazing at it. Something like that, but people have different ways and tones of doing it. That's, that can be self-enhancing. A lot of studies have showed that self-defeating or self-deprecating is by far the one that is received the best across cultures and everything, which makes sense, right? Because if you're going to be making a joke, making a joke about yourself, uh, is going to be most positively received by other people. The key is you're not making a joke about how bad you are at your job, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> you choose something that's unrelated. You choose, like you may say, you know, oh, yeah, I wish I had a, a, if I had any sense of style, then maybe I could get on this webinar, right, or something like that. Um, something that's very, very unrelated, low-key, self-deprecating in, in a gentle way, not in a way where you make people feel bad for you, but where it's just kind of like funny. Right. Yeah. And if you don't, if you show that you don't always take yourself so seriously, if there is a more serious topic to discuss, the person mm. discussing it with you will just be more relaxed because they think it'll, they're more confident the conversation will go well. I mean, there's so many examples of, exactly. of why this plays in. Yeah. Yeah. And then like Mary said, the aggressive kind. Now, as PhDs, going back to that critical thing, too many PhDs get aggressive gossip, right? Cutting somebody else down. You get together, you know how it is. Like somebody mentions, says something about somebody else. And then you're like, oh yeah, you're right. They really do do that. And it brings you two together for a moment. But you also have to be thinking, wait a second, if that person is talking negatively about the other person behind their back, what are they saying about me behind my back, et cetera? Like it's, it's funny until it's not funny, until you're the one on the other end of it. It's really uh, can be can turn pretty gruesome in an organization quickly and managers really have low tolerance for that because they know how quickly it can derail uh, a team and, and performance overall. Yeah. And I think after you have that kind of, you know, conversation, anything that follows, you're going to be seeing through this kind of negative lens. So it's going to affect just so much. Right. Yeah. Um, so perfect. So that helps us understand humor. Please thank Mary for coming on for the show me the data. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Good to see you. I'm very excited to move forward to our, our guest. We have a very special guest on today, as I mentioned earlier, Jeff Kreisler. He is just a typical Princeton-educated lawyer turned award-winning comedian, author, speaker, TV pundit, speech writer, and advocate for behavioral economics. Uh, he is co-author of Dollars and Cents about the psychology of money uh, with Dan Airely, editor-in-chief of uh, he's also the editor-in-chief of PeopleScience.com and speaker with Leading Authorities. He uses humor and research to understand, explain, and change the world. He runs PeopleScience.com, writes for TV, politicians, and CEOs, shares witty insight on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and Sirius XM, and uh, tours most of the planet. He's the winner of the Bill Hicks Spirit Award for thought-provoking comedy, international keynote speaker, author of the best-selling sat satire, Get Rich Cheating, on-air contributor to MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, Current TV, and Sirius XM, TV, and 2016 Democratic Convention writer for Governor Jennifer Granholm, talk, talker of two different TED Talks, TEDx Talks, uh, executive producer of the Final Edition Radio Hour, writer for Comedy Central, The Street, Nickelodeon, and IFC cast member of Shoot the Messenger from the co-creator of The Daily Show, and star of a bunch of comedy festivals. Very excited to have Jeff on. I want to show 
his book, Dollars and Cents. Love this book. We're going to put the Amazon link in the chat box. Make sure you get the book and read it. It will help a lot of you develop your sense of humor, become more charismatic, and kind of understand the behavioral psychology of, of really money, how to spend smarter, et cetera. But I love the way that he digs into, uh, the, again, the deeper behavioral psychology of how these things matter. He talks a, a lot about uh, business. A lot of different studies are mentioned in here. It's a great book, Dollars and Cents. Uh, so check that out. And we're going to bring Dan on now. You can go to his website too, or one of his websites, uh, Get Rich Cheating. Get Rich Cheating here. So very fun website to read. Very excited to have on Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for joining. We'll be able to bring him on here in just a minute. Hello. Hey, Jeff. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. Nice, uh, nice library. Thanks. Uh, I'll apologize in advance. They're doing construction next door. So believe it or not, this is as quiet as it can be. That's all right. I don't hear anything yet. So. Good. So you've done a lot of, uh, you've been involved in a lot and you've changed careers a lot, it sounds like. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey and, and why you've taken so many kind of left turns? In your uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, not to bore everyone. Uh, but basically I was on a path for traditional success through Princeton and law school and offered those big firm jobs uh, to be, you know, at age 22, the next step was 45 alcoholic and divorced. And uh it was not something I wanted. I admit I have some privilege in that I had some good degrees and I had a sort of a safety net built in. So I took some risk. Um, and I was always that guy that wrote down little observations in a notepad that had little funny sayings. Um, and actually, as I was studying for the bar in California, I took a comedy workshop uh, and it just really resonated with me as being this incredible tool for communication, potentially for behavior change, for education. Uh, and the only rule in comedy is you have to be funny. Now, it's a big rule. It requires an emotional response um, and connection and all these other elements, but you can sort of talk about anything. And more than that, what I found was really powerful was that that anything you could talk about was uh, open to topics that others might find challenging or difficult or stressful. Um, mm. I spent most of my career talking about politics. Uh, I talked about cheating in our culture. Um, now I do a lot of stuff about sort of behavioral science and psychology. And I've also talked about finance and money and economics. And all of the topics, different people find them to be intimidating um, or stressful, or they might even disagree, particularly in politics. Mm. Um, but I have found through the use of humor uh, that I'm able to engage in that conversation with folks and at least get them to listen um, and hopefully retain and, and learn and, and have a conversation with me, educate me back. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I would say the last sort of through line I've seen through it all is that you know, a comedian like a Jerry Seinfeld or Larry David type, they say, hey, ever notice people do the stupid thing? And then the behavioral scientist or the, the PhD says, yeah, this is why. And so they wow. sort of fit together nicely on either, you know, the yin yang sides of the coin, whatever your metaphor. So. No, I love that. Uh, I love that comparison. And uh, I want to ask you a little bit about, you know, the transition you had, especially from a, a you know, a advanced degree law, you know, as a, as a lawyer to, to getting into these different fields. Cause we have a lot of people watching who are trying to do their own transition but first on humor, you've talked a lot about it. And, you know, let's imagine we're talking to people that have no idea what humor is, which we might be for some. Uh, how would you describe humor, especially on a practical day-to-day -day basis? Not so much standing up in front of people as a comedian, but daily, how does it help? What are some of the behavioral psychology insights you could give us on the importance of humor and how to be humorous? Uh, there are a lot of benefits to, being, to using humor. Um, and I should put forward like a very important like caveat or, or warning that bad humor, as I think you addressed in the previous segment, like things that are aggressive or offensive or just misfire, like there's a big danger there. Mm. So when thinking about using humor, whether in the workplace or otherwise, like if you think it might not hit, I would say don't do it because mm. the risk is far too great. So that's my general warning. Mm. Uh, but when humor is used effectively, it can um, create more engagement. Uh, it can lower people's uh, sort of defenses um, and create a, a community feeling, right? Uh, there's, there's something powerful. If, you have, if your listeners and viewers haven't been to a comedy show, a theater, or a club, otherwise, like when a collective group of people all laugh together, mm. it's, it's incredible. It's this shared emotional experience that is so rare to have in any other setting. Um, and that creates a sense of community among strangers. Um, and that then it creates a bond that helps listening 
um, you know, obviously you said not just on stage, but uh, using humor, it, the, the self-deprecating humor in particular is, is particularly powerful because um, none of us are perfect. And oftentimes I think in the quest to seem perfect, we can come across um, whether it's abrasive or it's too full of ourselves. And um, you know, I always think that uh, the word humor is the same as human and humanity. That's kind of a silly comparison, but there is, yeah. you know, when you're self-deprecating, you sort of acknowledge your hum humanity. Um, I think of Don John Stewart as the perfect example when he's on The Daily Show. Like he was, you know, a very smart person, had very in, in great insight and, you know, wh whether you agree with him politically or not, you, it's hard to argue that that's not the case, but he also was very silly and self-deprecating and often made himself sort of the butt of the jokes. And that allowed the higher level commentary that he had to be accepted a little more easily because mm. he didn't come across and say, I'm super smart, you're super dumb, here's what I have to say. He said, we're all dumb and here's something I noticed. And mm. humor allows you to do that. Um, the good comedians, whether they're stand up or they're people that write for political speeches or whatever it may be, I think harness the fact that, that using humor can reflect the absurdity of our life and our existence. And sometimes reflecting that reality allows you to relate more easily to people. Yeah. And I love that comparison too, because it doesn't have to come at the cost of competency, right? Yeah. You can come across as very competent, but you can also, also be humorous. Um, you know, you've done a lot of work with people with advanced degrees. So I think you understand them. I want to uh, talk about an article that I, I believe you were an editor on mm -hmm. um, for PhD specifically here in a second. But, you know, you, you also have an advanced degree. You went into these other fields. What was the appeal of going into the other fields specifically after getting it, uh, such a high level degree? And then as speaking to people with high level degrees, how would you encourage them to make a transition of their own into to something different without feeling like, an imposter or they can't because right in academia we feel like well we need a degree to do that right uh, so how did you overcome that and what advice do you have um so i'll answer them sort of in mixed order those two good questions uh first of all we're always going to feel imposter syndrome particularly that old cliche the more you know the more you realize the less you know or whatever it is like the, yeah. the more we know and, and this is a smart audience you realize like you're not an expert and that's okay so you're always going to feel that, find your way to come to grips with that. Everybody has it. Some just don't acknowledge it. Uh, for me, when it came to different transition points, uh, what I tried to do is in some ways I sort of took a scientific approach. Like I, I sort of tried to break these choices down into all their elements. Like what was, what's important to me, right? Anything from like family to income, to feeling like a reason to get out of bed, to not working at night, to whatever the whole list might be, like having my voice heard, talking about certain topics, being respected, all the different elements. And I would look at the opportunity and I would see, well, how does this fit in? And more than that, like sort of what are the opportunity costs? And like if I'm gonna take a full-time job that satisfies you know, one or two or three things, but all that time means I can't do these other two things, is, mm -hmm. that, is that a fair trade-off? Um, and I would try to make the best choice that I could and by doing that, by breaking it down to the elements, it became a little easier for me to grasp and to understand what I was really choosing. Um, mm. Whether that was the choice to take a, a, a job that lasted a month or a year, or, or just where to where to go forward. Uh, you know, I, as I said at the top, I admit to a little bit of the, the privilege of having a fallback. Uh, and I think most of your viewers probably also have a similar fallback. If you have a PhD, it's, it's there, like that's an advanced degree. You're not likely gonna end up, you know, on the street somebody will value that in some way if your risk taking doesn't pay out. And, and having that safety net is a huge thing. You know, some people are made for the entrepreneurial risk taking life and who knows, um, a lot of people aren't, especially mm. as you advance in your career and you have a family and other responsibilities. Uh, mm. So, you know, as you do advance and have other responsibilities and as I've advanced myself and I have a family, uh, you know, the, the low bar for what something needs to accomplish gets higher and higher. And I just have to be honest with myself about what I can achieve. Um, hmm. One other thing I should say as far as transitioning that, that proved really important to me um, was to, to think about my skill set in a way that was non-traditional. Um, like I was a stand-up comedian who'd done some writing. But what does that really mean? And I would stop and think, well, I can um, communicate things uh, quickly and effectively, right? You're on a stand-up stage, you have five seconds to make someone understand something or they're drinking and talking. Uh, so how else could I apply that? And I started to break down these skills and PhDs can do this too, right? Like designing experiments and understanding noise and complex data sets and 
break them down in ways that then are, are more easily applied to what might be seem like an unrelated job. Um, the skills that a PhD has in any field just by going through a PhD program are, I think, extremely desirable for any you know, professional uh, organization, um, just as a matter of like the methodology that you've learned. But if you think of yourself, oh, look, all I know is molecular biology, you're restricting yourself. But if mm -hmm. you stop and think, I have five, seven, however many years experience going to the lab every day and meticulously making something work, that's a skill set that anyone uh, in an or another organization might value. Um, so I guess, Excellent. as I hear myself say it, a lot of it is breaking down the elements and, and sort of reframing um, your skills and, and needs and desires. Yeah, excellent. And, and for those of you listening, you know, what Jeff is talking about is transferable skills mm -hmm. um, and, and not just focusing on that hyper uh, narrow skill set that you have technically, but what the larger skills that allow you to excel at that focused skill set. Uh, great insights, uh, Jeff. Uh, a couple more questions sure. on kind of the how-to. All right, so again, a lot of professionals here, they think they got to be very professional and stoic, and maybe there's a certain degree of that, especially imagine going into an interview, but how can you loosen things up? Like, is there any sort of how-tos if you could break it down? It's not, you know, it's not magic, it's just a skill. Like, what would you, how would you, if you had to design a step-by-step -step program for finally being a little bit funny or humorous or playful, but in a professional capacity, what would that look like? Uh, well, first, everyone is, is, has a different level of what they can achieve in that. And I wouldn't want anyone to force themselves out of their comfort zone. The, the goal is essentially in interviews to, to be yourself, to mm -hmm. relate as you would to someone who has been your colleague for three years already. And so you're that comfortable because the person across the table is someone who wants to feel like, oh, I could be this person's colleague for three years. Mm -hmm. um, so... First of all, just being as prepared as you can be, uh, you know, in, in understanding the organization, understanding who's interviewing you and sort of putting yourself in their shoes, trying to think about what are they looking for. So the more you understand the situation, the more comfortable you'll be with it. It'll seem like something you've done before. Uh, I would also say that everyone here should really believe in themselves. I know it's a little cliche, but like at some point before the interview starts, just stop worrying about it. Like, you know, you have the answers. You know what you've done in previous jobs. You're smart, you know, like how to do molecular biology, whatever it may be. So just at some point, an hour before, the night before, just stop essentially cramming. Because I think on sometimes in these stressful situations, we're sort of cramming up to the minute and we go in very tense when we're not gonna learn anything new in that last hour of preparation. So we'd be better off like, preparing as much as you can to the night before than waking up in the morning and having a nice shower and a walk and just sort of getting ourselves relaxed. Um, we mm. will not forget where we went to college. We will not forget like who, who we are. Uh, and so just going in prepared, but not stressed is important. Uh, and then the final thing is if it serves a purpose, I, I believe if someone in the power of rituals to sort of get yourself in that um, relaxed and present mind space. Um, which will help you to listen, right? That key in, in good communication and comedy is really listening to the other person and hearing what they're saying and who they are. Um, you know, I have one little trick I like to share with people. It's sort of from my improvisation days where you look at an object um, like, uh, you know, this is my hair, right? But I look at my hair and I say quietly to myself, motorboat, or I look at my nose and I say, you know, spoon. Essentially like look at something and say what it's not and that just sort of like, it, it breaks that like tight tension that we often have mentally and allows us to relax and let the sort of absurdity of the world in. Um, mm. And again, you're not gonna run the risk of forgetting your name and your college and your resume items. Um, it just allows you to be a little less tense, be a little more present. Uh, mm. And you know, at the heart of again, a comedy or any sort of performance or really just in human interaction is being present and listening to the other person. Don't think about yourself, but think about that other person. And those are the types of tricks that can help you get there. Uh, yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, most of us here are fascinated by the behavioral psychology of, of anything. I know the field's exploding. So if you, if I could ask you just in terms of professional careers, uh, mm -hmm. people who want to advance, I know this is something you have a lot of knowledge of. Anything uh, fun or new in the field that you might be able to share, uh, like you just did about pointing to your nose and saying motorboat or whatever, that might be uh, interesting or, or helpful uh, for career advancement or just life advancement? Uh, well, you know, I right now sort of am 
very deep in the field of behavioral science and applied behavioral science. I run this website, People Science, which essentially is a, a place for a conversation between researchers and practitioners and those interested in what the field might hold. And what I'm seeing is, as you mentioned earlier, there's a ton of interest in the field. I think people are recognizing it's um, one tool in organizational toolkits to help solve problems. And so there's a growing number of opportunities. The challenge is that right now, most organizations sort of don't know what to do and what they're looking for. Um, and there aren't necessarily a ton of people trained to become professionals at this. So there is a bit of a gray area. Mm -hmm. um, we published a couple articles on people science, looking at different perspectives, particularly like, do you need a PhD or not? And, and thinking about the skill sets. And we, we published an article, why organizations should get a chief behavioral officer. Uh, and I think that what's a great opportunity in the field is um, to serve as sort of a bridge between the academic world, the research world, and the professional business world. To mm. be someone who can translate and speak both of those two different languages, and they are very different, right? You know, in mm. the business world, um, you know, the idea of testing and experimenting and learning from failure, even that, that is something very scientific, but in the business world, that can be frightening, right? Like, I don't mm. want this not to work. Tell me how to make it work. Well, we scientists people know that most experiments fail. And you can learn from that. And so being able to you know, communicate between those two different sort of elements uh, is a skill that's in great need, particularly in the behavioral world where um, the science is such that it's very context driven. Right? You may have, your listeners may have heard of like loss aversion as a classic behavioral thing. Like yes. you know, uh, in order to make up for a $10 loss, you have to have a $20 gain. That's a great principle, but like you can't just take that off the shelf and apply it to your app or whatever, right? You have to test it. And the scientist, in, in my belief, and what I advocate is that PhD knows how to test that, right? Mm -hmm. Knows how to like get rid of the noise, make sure everything's like properly, you know, organized. Um, the business person, the marketing director doesn't, right? They know mm -hmm. how to come up with clever catchphrases and what they want as a result. And so being able to bridge the two is powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a jobs board on our site and it's also elsewhere because there are, and we're seeing more and more jobs posted where people want some behavioral science uh, expertise. Mm. Um, there is a healthy debate in the community about whether or not you need a PhD. Uh, I think a PhD can only help you. Uh, again, it shows that you have like the real skills to really get things granular and make it effective. Mm. Um, the question is, do you, can you do it without it? You could, although in my mind, if you have, if you don't have the PhD, one of your tasks will be to make sure you get someone with a PhD to be on your team. Uh, yeah. So have it. Yeah. No, good points. Last question. I, I love sure. to ask these kind of questions. Um, what are some of the classic blunders that you see both in humor, somebody trying to be funny and it just never comes off beyond what you've already said. And even in behavioral psychology, classic blunders, especially relating to, you know, professional careers. Sure. Um, I'll take the, the last one first. In behavioral psychology, I think that the biggest blunder people make relates to what I was just saying, that people think you can you know, read Dan Ariely's book or read someone's book or, or, or know a principle and just take mm. it and apply it. Mm. And that's not the case. I mean, that's true really in any scientific uh, endeavor, but particularly in this field um, that's growing and, and we're just now getting tests out of sort of the more um, lab context and into the field. Uh, I think a lot of people whether they're an organization trying to apply it or someone trying to start a consultancy without real experience, making it seem like it's easy is the biggest mistake. Mm. Uh, as for humor, <laughs> there are a lot of mistakes that are made in humor. Um, I think keeping it narrowly focused to the professional context, uh, whether that's you're giving a talk or a speech uh, or just you're interacting with people, I think um, trying to be funny is a mistake. I think trying to be yourself is what people should aspire to do. Uh, because I think most of us in our lives, we are funny people. I mean, we haven't gotten this far without having some sense of the absurdity of the world. Um, so trying to be yourself, trying to be relaxed and have an authentic relationship with the people you're communicating with, uh, whether that's colleagues in an elevator or people around a table, that is gonna be when you become funny and real. Um, when someone tries to be funny and essentially takes a, a style of humor that really doesn't fit their personality, that's when the red flags go off, right? Whether it's an offensive joke or just a misfit between your personality and what you're saying, people notice that. Um, so, you know, try to be your, your real self as much as possible and you'll suddenly realize that people are laughing with you uh, because you're a pretty smart person. The smarter you are, I think the funnier you have to be. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Jeff, so much for joining us. Please thank Jeff in the chat box if you haven't already. I do want to encourage you to go to his book. Anywhere else that we should go to find out about what you're working on, what you're writing, websites? Uh, I think pe peoplescience.com, and you can always check out uh, my website. My other website is Jeff Chrysler, my name, K R E I S L A R. Uh, dot com, jeffchrysler.com, and that's my social handles too. So um, I welcome any follow-up questions or anything, however you reach me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited uh, by this group and the audience, and thanks for your time. Not Jeffrey Epstein. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, <laughs> different one. I, I was like, a different oh. conversation. <laughs> yeah. So this is, it's just your last name. Yeah. K-R-E-I-S-L-E-R. E-I. Go back. E-I. Yeah. Common mistake. Dot com. He was trying to figure it out for me, but yeah. there yeah. we go. All right. Now of course, these will be on my social and everything else. So. And the books. Of course, we'll put these in the post show notes. So please do me a favor. Thank Jeff. If you haven't already, Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you. All right. What a fantastic interview. Really appreciate Jeff coming on. And uh, if you haven't gone to his websites yet, all of his books will be here. Great website. And uh, of course, people, science. Uh, dot com it'll reroute to a url that's people science .com. either way there's a great article on here specifically for phds i'm showing on the screen to phd or not to phd now if you've already done a phd don't worry it's still for you because it talks about all of the strengths and skills and and especially those transferable skills that jeff was just discussing at the end that you have and that you should be focusing on for your jobs um, all of this is, <laughs> Lisa already beat me to it. All of this is in the chat box and we'll put it in the post show notes too. We're going to move right on forward to our, what we call internal guest, as in a PhD who has gone through the Cheeky Scientist Association is working in a career track. He's going to talk about this career track, how they got into it. Essentially, we're going to do an informational interview uh, so that you can determine whether or not this career track might be right for you. Uh, so we're looking at, Addis Furs bio on the screen. There we go. He is a senior modeling and simulation engineer and analyst at MITRE. Uh, he's an R&D engineer with expertise in computational material science, laser spectroscopy, x-ray diffraction, electrochemistry, and materials characterization, <laughs> excellent communication skills, as demonstrated by peer-reviewed publications, patents, conference presentations, and collaborative research awards. Uh, this is his LinkedIn profile, which we will share. Do me a favor, go find Addis, connect with him, go find Jeff as well. But we're going to bring on Addis now and talk about his career and what he does and how he got into it. So we'll make sure he can start his video. And we will jump in with our career segment now. Addis, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm, I'm excited. I don't think we've specifically interviewed somebody who's in model, modeling and simulation. Uh, so you mentioned that you are an engineer slash analyst. Is that your actual job title? That is my actual job title. There's a slash in the job title. There's a slash in the job title. <laughs> so it means you're going to be not just collecting the data, you're also analyzing it, correct? Yeah, so I basically develop uh, modeling and simulation techniques to analyze different uh, physics-based problems. Okay. And then I analyze them um, for my work. Yeah. Perfect. And how did you, how did you get into this? So maybe talk about all the way from, you know, the, I guess the conception of where you learned about this role and then what did the transition process look like for you and, and be as specific as you can in terms of, you know, I uploaded a resume or I got a referral or, you know, then I did a phone screen, a video interview and a site visit. What, what did it look like? Okay, so um, I'll start with actually about midway through my PhD. So midway through my PhD, I got a fellowship to work at Los Alamos National Lab, which is part of what's called the FFRDC system. That stands for Federally Funded Research Center. Uh, they're basically government labs or government funded labs that basically do research for defense related topics. And so when I did that fellowship, I realized that I really loved working in the FFRDC system because mm -hmm. it's basically a lot like academia in the sense of you can do all this really cool research and development, we can do fundamentals to applied, um, but not necessarily like academia, we have to teach or constantly do grant proposals. So it right. kind of seemed like the perfect kind of combination for me. 
Uh, however, I did not necessarily want to stay at Los Alamos, not because of any problems with Los Alamos. It was just because I needed to sort of be by the coast. So I moved to Washington, D.C. And uh, what I found is I found MITRE uh, when I was looking for a job title, um, had uh, a lot of work related to what I did in my PhD, um, which was uh, basically computational material science. They do computational work more broadly than just material science, but, uh, you know, basically physics-based computational work. And uh, it just seemed like uh, when I did the interview, uh, found, I found that application online, put in my resume. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I talked to some people during the interview. Um, it seems like the main thing that they were looking for is someone who just wanted to apply physics-based models to a really just broad array of problems. Any sort of problem was kind of thrown at you, not necessarily just materials or optics or whatever, just very, very broad. Perfect for me, I just kind of like solving problems. And so uh, came in for my interview. Uh, just really got along with everybody. Um, had some other interviews in the pipeline. Canceled them all once I got the offer and just said this is the place for me. Uh, then moved down. That's great. So it, when you were on the interview, was there any questions you can still remember that were particularly tough or that surprised you? Nothing that surprised me too much, actually. So uh, the interview, the way the way they did their interview uh, was that uh, I came in and I did a presentation basically on my PhD research. Okay. And then it, they did a technical portion of the interview where they asked me the normal technical questions. And I think for anyone who's gone through, you know, a dissertation or anything kind of similar, it yes. wasn't anything really out of the ordinary. Um, then it was mostly personality-based questions after that. And those were all um, pretty standard. I mean, a lot of things you hear about in Cheeky Scientist, um, sort of what type of things sort of drive you to do your work? Um, how do you deal with problems, uh, whether they're research problems or colleague problems? Um, and I very much got the feeling that the questions were geared towards not only probing my technical abilities, but also probing whether you wanted to work with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was very personality and work-based. So it was about, I don't want to say even between the two, but it wasn't that far off from even. And uh, nothing threw me out of the loop, but it was a very, very thorough. Yeah, and I think, you know, we see positions like this, I would say a little bit more on the engineering side where there is a larger technical portion. So it's good to see that. Um, did you get a sense that they were evaluating whether or not you'd be a good fit for the culture? And if so, did you get more kind of questions about how you get things done or behavioral or transferable questions on the site visit or before that? Um, so uh, a little bit, all of the above. So in my case, what happened was that for the personality based questions, uh, they were very focused on what were my interests, but that was partially because the, when they hire PhDs in engineering, they kind of want to make sure that you're not just, you, you did your whole PhD on one topic, right? Usually, yeah. uh, or one set of topics. They really want to make sure that you're interested in the broader array and make sure that you're actually interested in the type of work the company does, mm. uh, not just what you did for your thesis, mm. which may or may not be exactly related. Um, the other things that they were really probing for is, I mean, uh, so MITRE in particular, they really do want to have a very cohesive workforce where everyone really gets along, works well together. So there is a, definitely a very strong notion throughout their interview about my about questions about my personality, where I could tell that they wanted to make sure that I could work well with everyone. Mm -hmm. And I can actually say that now that I started working here, I've actually been on the other side of the interview. And I can tell you that when we do our internal conversations, a lot of it is based off of um, whether we each individually want to work with you. And uh, in general over here, the way it works is that everyone sort of has to, well, not necessarily, the hiring manager has sort of final say in everything, but uh, they really want to make sure that all the people during the panels and all the people that interact with you really enjoyed talking to you and really want to work with you. Mm. And it also meant that when you did start, you felt like, well, everyone here wants me here. Yeah, <laughs> that, great point. It also makes you feel great. That's a big reason why there can be so many interviews on a site visit or uh, so many panel interviews uh, or panel interviews in general. And I think a lot of us uh, don't understand that a panel interview is it's a totally different type of interview where you've got to engage multiple people at the same time. Um, and I, I'm just curious in your experience, how did you navigate that? I want to talk about what you do on the job, et cetera, but it's fascinating to hear about the transition process too. So you went into the panel interview, what did you know? Like, what do you, what do you know you did well afterwards? And then if you could go back, what would you have done a little bit differently on the panel interview? So um, I don't mean this in, in, in a conceited, I'm great at everything way, but I don't think I'll do anything <laughs> differently. Yeah. Um, in part because um, the way they very much do things here is that 
they want to make sure that everything about you fits and that mm. you feel like you are really a part of the culture. Mm. And I noticed that what happened was that <clears throat> obviously I tried to sell myself like everyone does. Uh, but because I gave very sort of honest answers, um, I felt like when they were very excited about what they were hearing, I felt very excited to come here and made me feel much, much, much more wel welcome. Mm. Um, so I think that that was, um, that was a great part. As far as dealing with the just panel, you know, a bunch of people. So in MITRE, we have two main locations, one in DC and one in Boston. Mm. And they brought over the people from Boston by VTC in a conference. So I had to actually interact with people in person and by VTC conference. Mm. And they did a very good job of dividing out the time so it wasn't too difficult. Um, and <clears throat> it was very interesting because you also got to see very quickly during the panel interview that there's some people who are very, very experienced, maybe here for 10 years or longer. And some people were very, very young and new. And <clears throat> it was the questions like from people who are younger and newer tended to be much more along the lines of, you know, how do you actually work? We really like this type of work because they most have PhDs too. They know the difference between what they did in their thesis and over here. And I've noticed that people with more experience are really just looking <clears throat> more for your, you know, your technical skills and also for um, just like, you know, maybe big personality flaws. Like if you can't really handle uh, being asked a million questions, which you were getting asked a million questions. So, no, no, that's great. And uh, I appreciate you walking us through that process. Uh, so let's, let's just move right along kind of in chronological order. So you got the job first day. What did you do? What did the onboarding process look like? Was it a lot of, you know, reading SOPs or watching videos test? Did you jump right in who trained you like any details you could give there? It was surprisingly like, um, very similar to, I'd say, the first year of my PhD, except friendlier. <laughs> um, it was very much like here, here's some very sort of broad based ideas of the type of projects you're going to be working on. To, to get, to do well in these projects, you have to learn a whole new set of skills that you didn't really have before. Mm. Um, that kind of overlap a little bit with your previous experience, but not that much. So here, we're going to invest um, in you to kind of take your sort of time and really learn and do well at these things. So it's mainly just sort of training myself hmm. with, however, I can say one big, big difference between that and my PhD is you train yourself during your PhD, you feel kind of usually a little bit alone. But over here, as I was trying to training myself, I was getting sort of nonstop emails like, oh, hey, do you need help with this? Or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, are you getting this part? You know, I can, you know, meet up with you for lunch and help. So it wasn't like a very, like alone, like you're just off on your own, but it was very much like, you're gonna have to learn these new set of skills and you're gonna to need to be able to train yourself. And there's a bunch of people here who would love to help you. And so use them as resources and work on your own to kind of figure out everything you need to learn. And as you get better and better, we'll give you more and more projects. Absolutely, that's great. No, it's good to see that they had something built out and that you felt, uh, yeah, like uh, you were supported. So you, you have been onboarded, you know, you're in your role now. What can you say you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Like maybe if you can't think of an average day, maybe think of a day in your average week, you know, how many meetings, how much time on emails, how much time on, you know, data collection analysis, like try to think of it in terms of the transferable skills, not too much in terms of, you know, something very specific technically or proprietarily. Right. So um, right now what I'm doing is, so my specific job is I have to basically develop simulation tools and techniques uh, to simulate different, um, defense related physics problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so mostly what I'm doing right now, which will differ a little bit in a few months, is learning these new sets of tools. So like what I'm doing is coding most of the day, kind of coding, trying to get my simulations to work, troubleshooting the simulations, mm -hmm. seeing, um, and of course that transfers into, let's say if you want to work somewhere else, just any sort of broad sort of programming based coding type job. Mm -hmm. um, eventually as I get my simulations to work better and better, you know, so much shift to, okay, you have all the simulations, they generate all this data for you to look at. Now sort of apply some of your data analysis tools like you did from your PhD, maybe, you know, some types of regression, some types of fits to your data, and then sort of answer a problem. So there might be a problem like we need to know this type of sensor works for this, you know, okay, you now can say that this is the best type of sensor for this type of application or mm. whatever. So right now it's very, very much co coding, programming, development based on most of the days. Um, and eventually it'll shift more to probably about 50, 50 between that and analysis. Um, as far as day-to-day -day meetings and stuff, uh, I'd say usually we have 
in my group about two-ish hour meetings a week, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, I've had one week where I had no meetings, and another week where I had three. Um, that varies a lot. Um, email tends to be uh, not too crazy. Uh, I think people like to be very communicative over here, but mm. it's also very much an office where you can just, uh, MITRE is kind of known to have a very flat organizational structure. So it's very much a comfortable place where, you know, if you have a question, the guy next door, you can just go knock on his door and say hi. Okay. So um, there's a lot of that communication as well. Well, what are the what do the department structures look like and which departments or people do you interact with, even if it's flat? Um, so, um, could you clarify the question a little bit? You mean like, you know, managers versus... Yeah, yeah. So, you said it's a flat structure. Are things organized more by projects, by department? Um, oh, got it, got it. And yes. If so, so it, who do you interact with? It, it's, it's more project-based. So, what, the way, so, the way my division works is that we have one really big overarching project. My division is called QUIC, C-U-I-C. And that's our big overarching project. And so you can um, mainly work within people within that group. That's, of course, a really big group. I mean, I think in my case, it might be 50 or so people. And then within that, there's sort of more specific projects. And within those projects, you tend to work with everybody within your project, mostly. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as uh, people, the upper level people, we have sort of um, multiple levels above you, like most organizations. Um, usually it's best to kind of talk to people one or two levels above you because they have a little more time than like the people as you go higher and higher. But uh, you can still kind of talk to anybody as, as, you, as you need. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, you can actually talk to people in other divisions very often for different problems. For example, there might be one, uh, actually one problem came up recently where there's a coding simulation technique that no one in our group was really that amazing at yet. But if someone in a different group at MITRE who's amazing at it and they sort of talked to them and they brought them on board to partially help with the project. So you can definitely cross collaborate across divisions as well. Um, even though the bulk of it will be with other people in your project. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. This is very thorough. La- last question I'd like to ask is where do you think you're headed or what are the options? So, uh, you know, maybe not just at your organization, but in general in the field, vertically, lateral, where do people go uh, after being in, in modeling engineering analyst roles? Um, so there's a lot of uh, vertical and lateral movement available. Um, I picture my, I really love my sort of group. Um, I get along with everybody, so I don't really picture myself trying to move too much laterally, but you never know. Sure. Um, as far as vertically, um, there are ways in which you can sort of keep moving up vertically in the research modeling end. Um, and there are also ways in which you can move up vertically to the more leadership management end. Mm. And one nice thing I like to, one of the reasons I chose MITRE is that they don't really make you choose that too early. You can actually continue rising through like the research ranks and everything for quite a while before you have to really get into the managerial type stuff. Or you can choose to early on switch over. So for right now, I picture myself mainly trying to stay in modeling and SIM. I love doing the actual research myself. But if, you know, five, six, seven years from now that changes and I want to do more managerial leadership type stuff, they do have that available as well. Um, that's That was definitely a big factor as to why I chose here is that they didn't really make you go into a certain track very early. You kind of gave, they gave you a lot of freedom to decide which track you wanted to be on. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulations again on your transition, your, your career that's advancing. And thanks for diving so deeply into the transition process, what you do on day to day and where your career is headed. Um, for those who are here with us in Zoom, the other associates, of course, uh, Addis is in the uh, association's private groups with you. If you do reach out to him, make sure you're adding value first, not just asking for something. Send a nice note to him about uh, him sharing and adding value here on the radio show, if you would. Thank you, Addis. All right. Thank you for having me. Great to see you on. Please thank Addis in the chat box if you haven't yet. This takes us to the end of the public portion of our radio show. If you want to learn how to transition into your first or next industry job, Cheeky Scientist is the world's largest platform specifically for PhDs. We will give you the blueprints you need and the job referral network. Over 8,000 PhDs in the Cheeky Scientist Association total. That is our flagship program that will help you get hired. If you want to learn more about it, go to phdsgethired.com. Enter your name and email. We'll send you our free job search materials and help you start choosing the right career for you and give you a blueprint for getting in that, into that career. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.